Hello and welcome to episode 95, part 1 for May 2020. This month we're going out live via Zoom and YouTube for our first ever live recording of a main episode. Hopefully to help alleviate some of the stress and anxiety about being cooped up indoors as a virus tries to sweep you away. We had a bacteria almost wipe us out during our first Martian invasion over 100 years ago, so let's see how you like it. Anyway, we've got a show filled with astronomy goodness, ridiculously clear skies to enjoy with planets returning to our skies, a new comet and the dazzling array of summer deep sky objects popping up over the horizon just waiting to be observed or imaged. So sit back and enjoy for the next hour as we go through the latest inspiring news from the world of astronomy, some stargazing inspiration for the month of May, Jenny takes a look at the submillimeter and far infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum and why they're so important to professional astronomy, and we answer a question about putting satellites in distant orbits. As with our live Q&A show last month, if you feel inclined, drop your astronomy thoughts or comments into Zoom or Twitter at Awesome Astropod, and we'll read through them as we go along. So let's make this as interactive as we can. So, on with the show. I'm Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me as always are Jen. Way! <laughs> <laughs> and Paul. Hello. 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 How are you both doing, guys? Good, thank you. Oh, I feel rough. I <laughs> see <laughs> so you've got different backgrounds last time, but you're still in Australia, Jen. It is still in Australia. This is the control room of the AAT, Whoa. the uh, Anglo Australian Telescope. Which is where you went when you were doing your research? Uh, yeah, well, we went for a visit, right? Um, up to Siding Springs, and so we got to have a look. Um, and I was in the control room. This is where I was when um, New Horizons made its closest approach to Pluto. Ooh. Oh, we're talking about that later. Yeah. And you've dressed down this time, Paul. I have, I have. I've gone all, all skater boy. It would be difficult to dress up from last time, wouldn't it? You were tuxedoed. <laughs> yeah, well, Quasimodo <laughs> is probably more the... <laughs> Esmeralda, the mouse. <laughs> so let's start up with uh, something that's uh, dividing opinion. And <laughs> we got quite excited about it. Twitter got quite excited about it. And it feels wrong to get excited about it. We were, we were enjoying some of the Starlink passes recently this past <laughs> week, weren't we? It's the uh, it's the love hate relationship, isn't it? Yeah, mm. it is. Um, I, I yeah was both kind of amazed by it and horrified by it simultaneously. It was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> But ironically, given that you are a die-hard observer and uh, sketcher, you were actually imaging it as it went over. <laughs> so that's, that's taking quite a leap, Paul. <laughs> yeah, um, it was great. You, you should have seen me. I was running a um, every Tuesday. I run an online um, astronomy event for for a group. Um, it was about fifty to hundred people come along, and it was the, the that kind of really good one of that kind of chain of about 60 and all yeah. kind of going over mm. in a long line every every kind of 20 seconds or so came over midway through um and somebody was i, I kind of half remembered it i'll like, oh, keep an eye out for it while we're sitting outside looking and um, one of the, the people went i can see something going over is this the same and everyone sort of <laughs> leaned back you can see everyone on zoom sort of leaning back and then it was brilliant because there's like 50 people going Wow, that's amazing! <laughs> and then me, I'm leaping out of my seat, being my usual, like that, that's incredible, that's incredible. Just sort of leaping around the garden, just disappearing off camera, going, "That's amazing!" And then the going, bit... "Actually, it's really awful." Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it feels wrong saying that something's awful that the rest of the world's going, "This is brilliant." <laughs> yeah, and the one I got excited about, the one I took some pictures of, was the the Falcon Nine. Yes, um, it's the first time I've seen a Falcon Nine go over, actually. Um, because that that was just amazing. That was really, really uh, just. Uh, I think the last couple of Falcons that could have gone over the UK was all cloudy where I was, so I never saw them. So it was just really exciting to sort of see the launch live on YouTube, yeah. see that that rocket take off, and then twenty minutes later, you like, like there it was is. going over. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. really cool. Uh, Peter Coates has just um, popped in on the, the the Zoom webinar chat and just put the, the live launch and then seeing it fly over 15 minutes later was pretty mm. fantastic. He got loads of workmates involved as well, which is nice. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was very cool. I I even got my other half out when she never does astronomy, so she she was very <laughs> excited. She even sat out and watched it over several evenings and looked at the stars and things. So, wow! Yeah, so. I managed to I managed to get my wife out as well to to take a look. Not that interested, but uh, <laughs> but I, I managed to drag her out anyway. Uh, but Jen, you've been uh, well, you've been beaming out onto the uh, the airwaves on radio I know, uh, on BBC no less this week. For yeah, for some reason, I became like the UK's expert on Starlink for a hot minute. I don't. <laughs> no, like what happened? But um, the BBC's go-to person. Yeah, I, 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 had, I had to feel because I've been on their like list of people that they can contact if anything interesting astronomy-wise happens for a while. But I haven't had any calls, and um, it was Radio Five Live called first, um, asking could I, you know, do a short interview about Starlink, and I was like, uh, yeah, okay, fine, ah, uh, panicking. Um, but I think it went well, and then. The next day, I got um, BBC Radio Wales and then BBC Radio Ulster. Like, well, they were originally going to be almost back to back. It was like I was contacting them. Um, I think my Alexa's just gone off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Turn but... it on Radio Ulster. Yeah. <laughs> Alexa, has Jenny been to Australia? <laughs> oh, see, that would work if I didn't have headphones in. <laughs> <laughs> but, um,. Yeah, the, it was going to be BBC Radio Ulster at like half past and then it was going to be BBC Radio Wales at like 22. So I was like coordinating with them both being like, I have to be off because I have to be on the phone again for someone else in like, you know, 10 minutes time. But then the BBC Radio Wales one got delayed and anyway, it was fine and it was very strange and I was famous for about two minutes. Yeah, it was really good as well. Thank it you. worked very, very good. Although my favourite bit was John was, was recording them for you. Yes, and yeah. the Welsh one, he recorded the wrong BBC Wales because there's also the BBC Wales that's in Welsh, which you yeah, weren't on. I think he did BBC Radio Cymru rather than BBC Radio Wales. And, and that was that was my favourite. So he's like, you're not on yet. There's a lot of Welsh pe- speaking people on. <laughs> 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 uh, that was my that was my favourite, but actually, were very very good, very good, very Thank impressed. you. I liked the BBC Five uh, Live one the best, I think, because I actually got to talk a little bit about like why do we like Starlink, why don't mm. we like Starlink? Yeah. Whereas the other two were very much like, when can we see it? What are we going to see? Job done. Yeah. Better yeah. better class of, of radio presenters on <laughs> national. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, following on from our live Q and A show, what was it? A couple of weeks ago, when we had Gavon, because it was just so fortuitous that we were recording that show at the point fifty years ago that Apollo thirteen was still making its way back to Earth as a kind of doomed spacecraft, hoping that they'd make it back. But there's been all sorts of Apollo thirteen stuff going on. Oh yeah, definitely. Like it's been I've just been loving my Twitter feed recently. It's just been you know, coronavirus finally went away for a few <laughs> days and it was just kind of dominated by like Apollo thirteen stuff like, you know, oh you know, oh. hey, they've just, you know, passed this milestone and it's like, Oh, you know, they're gonna come into land and it's like the parachutes have been deployed and it's like blah 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 and yeah, it was good. I I enjoyed the I couldn't take part because I was doing something else, but there were people who lined up the film with the launch moment. Oh, really? So they did it like a live launch, and they they timed watching the film. So it was like a mass watching of people, and they were all tweeting about it. Uh, John Chinner, I don't know if he's with us tonight. He he he, what did it? And and they timed the launch point in the movie to go along with the launch moment in reality. Oh, I is like that, that is that kind of like the space equivalent of when you're. When you're you're tripping balls on acid and you put Dark Side of the Moon to the Wizard of Oz, I think so. I think so. But it was so, John. If if you were tripping balls, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> but I I thought it was like one of those brilliant, geeky, nerdy, marvelous things that just was was just such a great idea. And and I wish I could have taken part, but I, I was I was busy. But I was kind of keeping on people like tweeting about it and saying like, oh, they got to this point, they got to this point. And it was brilliant. But I it. it it's really interesting how Apollo 13 does still capture people's imaginations, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it's, it's nothing like a bit of drama and disaster to, yeah. to kind of focus the minds. Quite right. I mean, that was the whole thing, wasn't it? That even Apollo 12, not many people were watching that because mm. they'd been to the moon and people had lost interest by Apollo 13. You know, I Love Lucy replays were 
um, repeats were on TV rather than playing these astronauts that were on the way to the moon. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. people's attention span is just crazy, isn't it? Oh, yeah. um, and we're going to have all that to look forward to again in <laughs> 2024 or whenever it is that they go back to the moon. Really? 2020? It's not going to happen. 2026, is it? isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be 2026. Seven, eight. Mm-hmm. Maybe 30. <laughs> oh, it's all going James Webb. <laughs> it's all going James Webb. And I mean, to be fair to, to NASA, they've definitely got a bit of delay built in now, haven't we? Well, yes. I mean, everything, everything's going to slip to the to right. So yeah. there, there is no way that that, that deadline's going to be met now. It's just, it's all, it's all moved to the right, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to yeah. have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Okay, so just move on to uh, to an email before we get into the main show proper and I've just got one that I want to read out from our good friend Clem Unger in Australia who emailed about our live show and I guess it applies to this one as well um, great show I enjoyed it despite the ungodly hour in Oz maybe next time it will work out to join stay safe Clem and we had a bit of a discussion about this because yeah we, we realised that you know with time zone it's going to be really difficult somebody's not going to work out but but ultimately we decided those in the Southern Hemisphere are in the vast minority and our own personal comfort is the most important thing in this. So we're, stick- we're sticking with eight o'clock. So sorry about that, Clem. I hope you're here. I hope some of our Australian listeners are still listening to this or, uh, or our New Zealand listeners. I think there's three of those. Um, and um, yeah, we if we do more live shows in the future, we will probably stick to this kind of time slot because it just works around hmm. the UK but so much better. Okay, so on to the show proper with some of the latest astronomy research. A goodbye to Hubble. Oh no. Something quite interesting about asteroids and a few more taunts towards Pluto. So Jen, do you want to kick us off with the news? Yeah, because uh, we're, well, when this officially gets released, right, we're going to be in May. Um, Yeah. And it is tradition for me in May to review the wonderful April Fool's papers that were uh, released at the start mm. of last month because you know they're always released on the first of April, right? So we yeah. we always miss them for the April shows, um, and there were some absolutely stellar ones, uh, pun perfectly intended. Then, um, so <laughs> <laughs> the first one um, is from researchers at Oxford, including our very good friend Chris Lintot. Um, he's on this paper. This is defining the really habitable zone, and it discusses the problem <laughs> yeah. that. Although we know a lot about planets in the habitable zones of their stars, um, where you know the temperatures are right, we think for liquid water on the surface of these planets, are any of them actually worth inhabiting? Right, and so they define <laughs> the really habitable zone as the region around a star where acceptable gin and tonics are likely to be abundant, <laughs> which I, I very this. much agree with. I yeah, I agree this. with yeah. this criteria. That is very Chris Lintot. So I've got some <laughs> quotes from the paper because they are. Yeah, they're just sublime. So we've got, um, in common with much of the work in the field, we rely throughout on assumptions which are difficult, if not impossible, to test, which is very, very true of astronomy. And uh, we suggest that planets in the really habitable zone be early targets for the JWST, because by the time that thing finally launches, we're all going to need a drink. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course no paper's complete without an acronym right and this one has magic which is the minimum acceptable gin and tonic and in true <laughs> astronomy form it's you know minimum acceptable gin fine and then it's the ick from tonic <laughs> yeah, see, I, I, I can accept that one yeah i can accept that i'll go with that one yeah so uh as long as it's tenuous yeah, another the next one I want to talk about is um, some researchers at Cambridge propose searching for space vampires with um, TESS, but it's T E subscript V S S, standing for the Transient Exo Vampire <laughs> Survey Satellite. <laughs> Uh, and, and this paper opens with it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single human in possession of a good space telescope must be in search of a space vampire <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in this paper they say that they want to look for vampires which are trapped in the gravitational pull of M dwarf stars and they provide two different model light curves for these vampires one for those in bat form and then one for them in human form <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, across the pond, um, Mike at Caltech says, making it rain, how giving me telescope time can reduce drought. And he shows how recent observing runs he went on resulted in a 200% increase in rainfall than typical for the area. <laughs> <laughs> and so telescope committee should give him and his team an unlimited amount of telescope time for telescopes in drought-stricken areas. It has to be worth a go. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, see, I don't, I don't, I don't think that one's even a joke. That's true, that, surely. I, this is the thing. I, I, I think it's thinly veiled as a joke and it's really the astronomer going, please, for the love of God, give me telescope time. Um... My last one then is uh, Douglas and Ali from the University of British Columbia in Canada. And um, they give us a new logic for finding life. And they argue that this is going to allow us to become a lot more successful in finding life elsewhere. And the logic goes, uh, elephant, all elephants are grey. Mice are grey. Therefore, mice are elephants. Mm-mm. All right, this is how the logic works. So then for the exoplanets, it goes, the Earth has life. Some other places are like the Earth, and therefore these other places have life. And although they're kind of trying to make a jokey argument, I feel like that's actually not too far from the sort of logic that we do actually use, because we say, like, the Earth has water, the Earth has life, therefore where there is water, there must be life. I I have a feeling they're trolling the exoplanet community with that comment. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. In a big way. (laughs) Yeah. Um... But yeah, so th- those were the ones. There were more. Um, there was one about dark matter, which I didn't really understand. But <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does. No. Um, but yeah, so if you want to go and have a look at them, um, yeah, you just type in things like space vampires and the really habitable zone, and, and I'm sure that the papers will come up. Um, so presumably they just dump these on archive. Yeah, they, they just they get dumped on get archive. On hope. Yeah. yeah, they they obviously not published in like a, a proper <laughs> yeah. journal. No, Getting but it through nature. <laughs> yeah, there's like a special, you know, sort of. I guess. I mean, I've never done one. Maybe I should do one next year. But I guess they yeah. just kind of flag it to archive and be like, "This is an April Fool's paper," because you, you know, when when you like submit a paper, you have to sort of say like, "Oh, which categories it belongs to?" You know, is it galaxies, star formation, whatever? And some of them had like, you know, space telescopes, garlic. As like the the criteria for the different papers, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, proper news. Um, and my first bit is just casually mentioning that um, it's been thirty years since HST launched. Yay! Yes, yeah. Yeah, whole thirty years. Twenty wow. fourth of April. Yeah. So it was. Uh, Goodness me. What three days ago? As as we're recording. Uh, mm. Here's here's a little fact to make you Martians feel old. I haven't actually known a day without Hubble staring at the skies. Yeah, thanks for that, Jim. <laughs> Cheers for that. I need Cheers. a drink. I was I was at secondary school when that thing launched. I remember watching mm. it. Yeah. I I was but a twinkle in my father's eye. Mm. <laughs> But um, yeah, so three decades, right? Hubble has completely changed our understanding of the universe, right? It's really not an exaggeration to say that. It's discovered galaxies that existed 400 million years after the Big Bang. It's explored the atmospheres of exoplanets. It's unraveled the solar system. It's discovered black holes. And it's been part of 15,000 research papers, which I think is pretty extraordinary. So that's um, got to be a record, hasn't it? Mm. Well, it's got to be, surely. 15,000 papers, you know. So anyway, happy birthday, HST. Um, um, uh, just two, two, two comments from the chat on your, your, your ageism. We've got uh, Miss, Mr. Morgan says, time to throw her off for that comment. <laughs> um, does it, what does it mean? Does it mean off a cliff, off <laughs> an event horizon? Astronomy According to Mountain Madman says, nice work, Jen, look at them squirm. I know, right? <laughs> it's great. I mean, you guys always try and make me pronounce things that I can't pronounce, and so I feel like this because is you're too young. like my getting back at you. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so before we move on from Hubble, um, a little bit of disappointment, really. Uh, it's Comet Atlas. Oh, oh, I'm oh, sorry. No, I've just got to just oh. just quick interrupt because there's another great comment just coming. Yeah, go on. First time watching live. Always thought Paul was the younger. Actually, that's a bad comment because that suggests that uh, that he thinks now you look older than me, well, which is which is bad because I'm older than you. <laughs> you are, you are. Yeah. But you've got kids, kids yeah. age. I have. And they do. They do. They do. Yeah. I'm actually only 24. <laughs> and uh, Damien's somewhere in the wings in the Methuselah. background, and he always makes us all feel younger. Uh, Damien <laughs> Methuselah. Yeah. Painting in the in the attic. 
<laughs> he, he remembers. He remembers. He doesn't remember just the HST being launched. He remembers Herschel building his first telescope. <laughs> In fact, he helped. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, Jen. No, it's yeah. all right. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, we are going to talk about something sad anyway, so we may as well delay it for as long as possible because it's Comet Atlas. Um, oh, yeah. And you're right. You know, the comet of the of a generation is what it was mm. hoped to be. Naked eye visibility. Uh, it's not yeah. the case, is it? Um, Hubble's recently took a few images of it and the nucleus has clearly broken up into several pieces. Uh, and this is obviously terrible for amateur astronomers, but not necessarily for the professionals because although everyone is disappointed about the breakage, uh, it actually gives astronomers a great chance to study why these mm. comets break up and what they're made of. And so, you know, we can still learn mm. a lot of stuff about it. So, you know, silver linings. Yep. And yeah, it looked, really, it looked really cool. Yeah, it did. It looked really yeah. good as it was breaking up the images that people took, and that's that's a really good thing to see as well. That there are so many more amateur astronomers that have got the kit and the sensors yeah. now to be able to take just from people's back gardens really good images of these mm. things that was pretty much impossible unless you got professional grade equipment ten mm. years ago. Mm. Yeah, and we've got Swift as well as a potential replacement. Um, we have Comet the, Swift. Go on, someone, someone say it. Someone say it. Cats and comets. Go on, say it. No, what? The cats and comment, cats and comments comment. Someone's got to say no, it. Don't know I, it. Nope. No. Nope. Oh come on. No. Nope. Comets are like cats. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, push my glasses up my nose. They they have tails, tails and they and, and they, they do, do what they like. <laughs> <laughs> do you want my cat's done today? Nothing. She has literally sat in the middle of my bed and slept for about twelve hours. Well, that's good because if she starts sublimating, she'll break up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and get a tablet to stop her doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but Damien's saying that's a normal day for a cat, though. Yeah, no, yeah, it, I every mean, day it it's true. And he's had a long experience of what cats do. He yeah. remembers when they were worshipped in Egypt. In Egypt. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that's it. They're just yeah. bitter now. They just lie there going, I <laughs> remember when I was a god. Now look <laughs> at me. Yeah, Damien remembers that. He was the original pharaoh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Ross? Is he cool enough to be a pharaoh? Me with pharaoh's cat tamer. <laughs> All right, anyway, right, I'm going to yeah. finish my news before this recording of an hour turns into two. Um, yeah. <laughs> but my last story is about another disappearing act, and this is that Former Holt B is no more. Mm. What? Yes. We've lost a planet. So Former Holt Blanky. is um, a very bright nearby star. Uh, it's only 25 light years away. So when we found a planet around it um, in 2004, everyone was super, super excited. Um, so, you know, it's a to have a planet that we can actually image, you know, we can actually physically take pictures of it was, was very, very exciting. Um, and especially because this was a, a young planet because Fomma Holt has a big debris disk around it. So, um, you know, it, we were seeing what we thought we were seeing anyway, the very early sort of stages of planet formation. Um, but follow-up images um, have found that, yeah, the planet has literally just disappeared. Um, over 10 years, uh, images from, guess where? Hubble. Uh, yeah, I see I have a bit of a theme for my news <laughs> this month. Um, but yeah, images from Hubble um, showed that from Hobby, it kind of just slowly, slowly fades in brightness and then just kind of like, like got more and more diffuse and kind of grew in extent. And um, so now they think that it's probably, guess what? Guess what? Dust. <laughs> well, well, whoever it was that mentioned that on the chat room in, in the chat group just a moment ago was absolutely right. Well yeah, done. <laughs> that is Morgan Morgan says it'll be dust, and you are right, Morgan Morgan. Uh, they think it is a cloud of dust, uh, probably from the collision of two planetesimals. Um, yeah, so, so so almost an exoplanet. Almost, well, almost an two. exoplanet. <laughs> Not quite though. Um, so just just my naughty naughty question: How many of the exoplanets we so far classified aren't? Ah, oh, see, oh. now I asked mm. this very question because we talked about this. We had a group meeting um, last week and we talked about it. And um, I asked that question. I was like, so like, uh, how many you know exoplanets are actually just dust? And the exoplanet expert is confident that all the exoplanets that we have found are 
going to be exoplanets it's because this was a very unusual system because it's actually like a, a system that we look at we can visibly see the pictures so the planet wasn't detected by like the transit method or the radial velocity or anything like all of those are safe um it's mm -hmm. only going to be the systems where we're kind of looking at pictures of them that maybe we're not looking at a picture of the right thing um however the difference here is that because from hot is such a young star and it's got this great big debris disc around it we would expect maybe to have more of these artifacts than we would around say like a, a normal mm -hmm. a normal sort of more of a long sort of main sequence life star um so it should be fine this should be a fluke um because seeing something like this is extremely rare. Yeah. It was a yeah. fantastic image, though, when we mm. first saw mm. it, and it was quite groundbreaking as well. Yeah. So bring us back into the solar system. Paul, what have you got for us? Right, okay. First up for me, it's asteroids. Love an asteroid. They're, frankly, they're one of the great overlooked components of the solar system. Mm -hmm. Everyone obsesses about Mars and Saturn. Curiosity this, Cassini that. Oh, aren't I so beautiful, says Saturn. Look at my sexy driver of a bed, says Mars. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Asteroids. Um, the great unloved detritus that seem to be viewed as nothing more than the next resource for late-stage capitalism to exploit uh, once the investors can uh, trick enough fools to part with their cash. Um, well, as ever, uh, when we look more closely, secrets and surprises are revealed. And in this case, it's about centaurs. Mm. So... Those are the asteroids that sit amongst the larger outer planets, um, mm. and they cross the orbit. So they're, they're the sort of definition of them is they they kind of orbit around Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus, um, and they must cross at least one of those orbits. They usually cross more than one, um, and they're they're an oddity because they've always been a bit of an oddity um, because they have really weird orbits, but they seem to be quite stable. So they've always been a bit of a, a curiosity, um, and well. It turns out we 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 um, the, a team led by um, Fatih Noumani at the Observatory La Côte d'Azur in France, joined by various institutes in Brazil, including the uh, University Estadal Paulista. Nice um, I hope that was right. Um, <laughs> I've had a look at the strange but stable orbits these bodies have and modelled them a lot. And when I say a lot, they made ten thousand clones. Wow. of 21 of these these centaurs Blimey. so they 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 did 10,000 copies of each one and did a lot of simulation to see where they might have come from um and they've come to the conclusion the centaurs are a population of stolen asteroids oh, these aren't bodies wait, from our from solar where? system from the well, inner solar system from another solar system whoa yeah oh. these aren't Mars solar system objects um uh, you know how we got excited about mwah, mwah, mwah. everyone, everyone <laughs> on, on YouTube doesn't know how we mwah, mwah. Yeah, Paul can love everybody now not just us mwah, mwah. please fix me the love and uh, Borisov you know the, the two kind of the, the transiting the exo comets that have, have mm. passed through mm. Everyone got excited about them, and then we've been thinking, oh, how can we have a mission to go and kind of have a look at these? Well, it turns out there's a whole population of them sitting in stable orbits just by the gas giants, um, ready for the looking at. Uh, so it's more exciting. So cool. cause if, if you remember, this is the target of a mid-decade NASA mission as well. We talked about this a few months ago. Yeah. So that's exciting. We may be about to explore fragments from other star systems. So how confident are we? Is this just a hypothesis? No, it's, it's a hypothesis, but it's, they're very confident based on this modelling that basically the only way these things can be where they are, in the orbits that they are, and they've done a lot of modelling, is that they've been ripped out of other systems. Oh, in, in sort of oh gross, taking a look close... at the mineralogy of those would be exciting, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. And... What's interesting is they're potentially the, the way this would happen. They're potentially fragments from the sun's siblings, oh. picked up in that the kind of early days inside the open cluster that the ah. sun was sitting in with its other you know brothers and sisters as it formed. So you imagine the early solar system forming in that open cluster. There it is, and close, much closer proximity to other stars. They move around and flung out, um, mm. and so these have been potentially ripped out of these other systems. So. I love it. Will uh, they have a gold mine of, of, of information and data? Potentially, we we have a whole population of bits of rock from other systems potentially yeah. within reach. Um, if you want to follow that up, that's in the monthly notices of the RAS this month, uh, published actually just three days ago. 
So that's that's hot off the press, that one. Cool. Um, okay. Well, um, look at <laughs> oh, those Paul, tiny hands of Paul. The of Paul. There. <laughs> Rahul said, look at those tiny hands of Paul. I tell you what, people are shitting all over you, aren't they, tonight? Yeah, like... <laughs> yeah you put them nearer to the camera and then they'll look bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit here with my massive hands. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person. Do you know, I used to, I used to have a when I first started teaching many years ago, um, I had a, a student. I, I took a, a trip to France, and this year nine girl sat down next to me and said, "Oh, sir, I do feel sorry for your little chipolata fingers." <laughs> at least, at least she said fingers. <laughs> it's like the, the, <laughs> but it was like the pity of a fourteen-year-old about my short, fat fingers. It's like, thanks, thanks for that. Thank you. I have Thank really you. small ears. <laughs> do your glasses do your glasses fall off regularly? No, but it's just when people see me, like they'll be my friend for a few months and then one day we'll just be having a conversation and they'll just stop and they'll like lean in and they'll go Your ears are really small and I'm like I'm <laughs> old. <laughs> and then they can no longer be your friend. Then that's it, as why I don't have many friends. <laughs> right. Small okay. Ears. Small anyway, ears. enough enough with the uh, the small body part. Which I'm getting before... keeping discreetly covered with my hair <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay, next up, Pluto, the not planet that is causing debate around its origin. Uh, namely, did it have a hot start or a cold start? Uh, this is all based on the data gathered by New Horizons. We I said we were going to talk about New Horizons. Remember that five years ago now, believe it or not. Oh, New God. Horizons was five years. Five ago. Yeah. years, I know. Don't even I think Shelley was in Australia then. Five That's when I peaked. years ago. I peaked five years ago. It's all been downhill since then. Five years. I it's just I had more hair and like bits of me worked. My knees didn't ache then. <laughs> wow. Anyway. Um, anyway, the data is rich, the data is interesting, and the analysis is revealing all sorts of interesting things. In this case, the evidence seems to be coming down on the side of a hot start to the little planet that isn't early years. Uh, both scenarios point to a subsurface ocean of which we now have, we, we sort of have evidence, but it, it's this question about, was it a cold start? So is it a sort of icy ocean that um, happened in this sort of gradual accumulation of stuff. Mm. So did it... Get over it, Matthew Hodgson. Um, <laughs> so um, he's saying not planet, dead to me, Paul. Anyway, so the gradual accumulation of this stuff kind of building up and you know, Pluto grew slowly and so there was a sort of subsurface ocean that was cold and, and, and took a while to form and things like that. That's that. But if if we saw that, we would see compression features on the surface. So if it was made up of lots of little bits coming in, you would see it slowly. It would be just constantly compressed and compressed as the gravity built up. It would pull in the next layer of stuff, and you would see these sort of crushing compression features on on the surface. If it had a hot start, as in it was it formed very very quickly, and therefore had a sort of warmer liquid ocean underneath, and it kind of kept its internal heat and didn't leak it out to space so quickly what would happen is it would cool down from the from the surface down and of course the ice would expand and you would get um these sort of expansional features so of course as the ice expands you you would get these features as, as the kind of surface expands outwards in various sort of forms and, and that would be the clue that we had a hot pluto star and that there was a, a sort of deep liquid warmer ocean at work and well the the They've been searching, and a team from the U U.S. universities that were involved in the New Horizons mission, um, they they were presenting at the 51st Planetary and Lunar Conference, remotely and virtually, I might add, as is the fashion these days. Mm. And they presented this this uh, evidence around the Sputnik Planitia that it's full of expansional features, um, and that Pluto's actually uh, demonstrates just by looking at the expansional features on the surface that it was a hot. Pluto to start with and therefore had a, a sort of deep liquid warm ocean at the beginning and formed really quickly which tells us all sorts of stuff about the Cooper belt and the outer parts of the solar system so exciting stuff if you want to follow that up it's the plausibility of an ocean on Pluto shortly after accretion lovely nice. thank you very much Paul 
And for the main news story this month that we want to discuss, we've got something that highlights something that we mention quite often. That's the value of going back over old data, as astronomers have just done with old Kepler space telescope mm. data. And they've only gone and blooming found the most Earth-sized potentially habitable exoplanet. I mean, it, this it, is... It's an Earth yeah. 2.0 alert. Ah, ah, I mean, ah, on the face ah. of things, it's 1.06% larger than Earth, which I think, given that this is the transit method, means that it has to be by... Volume. Volume. Because Volume, yes. as it goes across, you're seeing the size. Or it's really, really flat. It's actually like plate kind of <laughs> <laughs> or it's just a big disc <laughs> it's a space vampire who's curled up in a ball or it's just a projection like the moon is yeah yeah exactly <laughs> just mirrors mirrors mm. there's, all nothing, the there's nothing there's nothing beyond the orbit of mars it's all mirrors <laughs> we know from a telescope manu- um, uh, retailer that um there is somebody that will happily come and sit in their showroom and talk to them for half an hour about how the moon is just a hologram projection mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway back to the new story yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> this is this is really good. This is this is really exciting because what I liked also is this was quietly announced. It wasn't the usual da, 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 we found Earth 2.0 quick something. Yeah. There wasn't anything like that. It's just they found more they found some old data and went, eh, look at that. It's quite clear yeah. that all of NASA's press team are furloughed, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> because we're getting proper science rather than just extravagant news stories exactly it just <laughs> quietly slipped out and it was really exciting because it's yeah. only 300 light years away yeah when it's I, not that when i was reasoning about this i think it also highlights the value of getting people to still look at data because yeah. this was found in data that had sort of been checked by the sort of ai and the automated mm-hmm. um processes that they have and it hadn't been classified as a planet and so people went back over the sort of things that had been chucked out just to double check them and mm. and here we are that. Yeah. and this is Earth this is cropped up twice this this the importance of having humans checking it because just in the last show well the last q and a show a couple of weeks ago, Chris Lintock was talking about the mm. AI algorithms looking at supernova and ignoring one because it was too bright yeah um it, or it considered it to be too bright and just yeah. ignored it but when yeah. people went over it again they realized it was and it just makes you wonder about so many things now that are being left to ai to look at how much are we missing I and think, you know something like this just writes it large it's earth I, 2. I think 0. we're going to get a lot more of this just just from the sheer volume of data that there is anyway regardless yeah. of ai i mean kepler the amount of data that kepler took in its mission is just vast yeah. and every mission is, is providing more and more data that's going to take years to go through. I mean, it's like yeah. that New Horizons data we were just talking about. You know, that was five years ago. Yeah. And they're only we're only talking about stuff that was just taken from images and the surface details and things like, you know, radar passes and things. That it's been around for five years and it's taken this long to, to get to even just the sort of topography stuff. So this, we're going to get loads more of this. This is really exciting for this. Yeah. And it's interesting as well that I think it was Jen that was that had a new story a month or so ago about how planets around red dwarf stars actually might be more habitable than we first thought. Mm. Um, and of course, this is uh, an exoplanet around a habitable, sorry, uh, around a red dwarf star. So its habitability zone is much closer in to something that we would expect to flare more, be more radio uh, radiation unstable. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, based on some more research that's coming out now, that it's it's any less habitable. Mm. Yeah, that research from before was um, a couple. It was a team of like astronomers and biologists. They sort of teamed up, and they did. Um, so the astronomers sort of modelled the amount of uh, UV flux that you would expect to get at the surface of Proxima um, during like one of these flares, and then. Um, the and what sort of atmosphere you would need to protect the surface of the planet from this uv radiation uv radiation is really damaging um because it it literally like breaks apart dna and stuff it completely destroys life um we use it to sterilize the air and the water here on earth so it's it's pretty bad but um you know they fit so the astronomers found you know uh, that you didn't have to have oxygen in your atmosphere to have protection from uv you could just have a combination of nitrogen and carbon dioxide which is great because that's the first time that's ever been shown 
And then the biologists just, were like, hey, what if we don't have an atmosphere? Could life survive without an atmosphere? And their answer was yes, that you get a small proportion of like the, the bacteria survives. And then it's a question of how long does do the bacteria need to sort of grow back up into a big colony um, before then when the next flare comes in, they can sort of survive and there's just this cycle of destruction, but never total destruction. So uh, yeah, maybe not big old aliens but maybe some bacteria so yeah it's interesting yeah. who knows yeah so um i think damien's somewhere there in the background i don't know if you can speak out but um i did ask him just before we went live um if there was any possibility that he could put the the stinger music between segments in and uh, if you are there damien what did you say Methuselah said no. <laughs> it was a plain no. So I don't know if we can bring in anyone else that's on this show to do as a little uh, a little stinger in the middle. Can we do that, John? Does anybody want to? Because uh, we're, we're going to move between ditty. segments now. Can we, someone give us a... Is this going to be the awesome, awesome Astronomy Choir? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen it via Zoom. Who's, I, I, who's, who's in? Who's in our, 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 our little box here? They, they, they might. They might. Someone might do it. Does anybody want to do it? Give us a shout out. Come on. Does somebody want to do it? I Give feel us a wah, 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 that wah. the answer is no. It is. No. Oh, oh, they've all gone quiet. Yeah. So they they spent the last half hour insulting me, <laughs> and now they yeah. like you asked them to do something, and they've all like gone off for a piss and a yeah. beer or something. Bastards. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on then. Um, so we'll turn our attention to the practical side of the show with our monthly sky guide. And this month we're returning to the promise of lots of planets on display, a new comet and a couple of meteor showers. But we'll start further afield with the great bear Ursa Major. Ursa yeah. Major, biggest northern constellation, third largest overall. Uh, it's beaten by Hydra and Virgo, but still it covers almost, <laughs> get this, 1300 square degrees of sky what yeah it's, <laughs> it's massive it's, isn't it it's massive like I, I i was looking this up and i was like no i don't believe this but yeah almost 1300 square degrees of sky um of sky. and i reckon that although people probably don't necessarily know that they know where earth's major is if people aren't really into their astronomy they do because they know that asterism of the big dipper the plow or in my very welsh accent the saucepan so <laughs> suspend the suspend. ping yeah um it's also like it has a long history right it goes back to homer talks about it ptolemy talks about it it's even in the bible of all places so look at that. science religion mm. hand in hand mm. so yeah ursa major the the greater she bear is actually the official translation Mm. how about that the greater she bear uh, it's probably one of the oldest constellations as Jenny said in human history it's evidence actually goes even further back than the bible that, that it's known in prehistory that the, this was referred to as the bear and, wow. or the collection of stars certainly um, uh, is kind of recognised a long way back um, if you want the Greco-Roman story okay, it's the nymph Callisto who is lusted over by Jupiter, the dirty cad. Um, <laughs> and the uh, the big J's missus, Juno, discovers that there's a son, Arcus, who's oh, born damn. of this... Yeah, is born of this oh, little damn. liaison. So she turns Callisto into a bear. Mm. Do, 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 I mean, that's, that's one way to stop it <laughs> okay. happening again, right? Arcus, no, but Arcus, right? Arcus, oh. the son, comes across the bear almost kills his own mother I feel right? like this is like brave or something this, this is I, what exactly this is exactly what I was thinking I was like ah oh, I see where Disney were going now yeah um, and so so to avert the tragedy Jupiter the dirty cad turns Arcus into a bear and mother and son live on as Ursa Major and Minor in the sky Ah, isn't that lovely isn't that lovely uh, other traditions see the group as um, sages, the seven sages in Hinduism, or as a group of heavenly objects, as they do in China. Um, location, 
A is probably the least difficult one. At the moment, look straight up at Zenith. It yeah. is there. Uh, you'll not fail to see the familiar saucepan shape that forms the arse and tail of Jupiter's ursine crumpet. Um, <laughs> it will, of course, uh, move uh, around the sky, um, though through the year, of course, orbiting Polaris through the night, in fact. Um, and this is where it gets its other ancient name from, the um, Hel- Helike, which means the turning. Thank you very Isn't much it? for that. I need my pipe now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to cover a couple of uh, deep sky picks now that are in Ursa Major, and I'm going to go with a trio of sensational galaxies to observe in small to medium sized scopes. So anybody should be able to pick these out. Um, actually, two of them can be viewed together, while the third is like looking at our own Milky Way galaxy from above. So for the uh, the dedicated amateur astronomers, you'll already know what I've picked. And the first one up is Messier 101, the pinwheel galaxy. And although it's listed as magnitude 7.9, its light is spread out across the galaxy, giving it a kind of general low surface brightness. So it really doesn't stand out quite so well, meaning that you may need to really lower the magnification. That's a top tip with these kind of low surface brightness galaxies to lower the magnification don't keep trying to crank it up or, or just be patient and employ averted vision um, unless you use a six inch scope or larger but it's well worth the effort because this is what's called a grand design spiral galaxy meaning that it has a well-defined structure and the spiral arms are apparent in telescope views uh, it has also had four times more occurrences of supernova than the average over the last 100 years mm. and two in the last six years. So it's one to keep an eye on because there's clearly something going on there that's create, creating more uh, more supernovae than you'd expect. Um, to see 101, find the two handled stars, Alcade and Mizar, in Ursa Major the Plough. M101 forms the apex of an equilateral triangle above these two stars. Then next up is the twin galaxies of Messier 81, Bode's Galaxy, and Messier 82, the Cigar Galaxy. To find this pair, move up the handle of the Big Dipper to the star that dips down to begin the bowl, Fad or Fector. Now draw a line from that star to the end star back out of the bowl, Dube. Continue that line for the same distance and you get a spiral galaxy and an edge-on spiral galaxy, both within the same field of view of a low-power eyepiece. Now, gravitational interactions between the two galaxies set off rapid star formation in MH2, leading it to often being referred to as a starburst galaxy. <laughs> the reason that it stands out... <laughs> The reason that it stands out more than its companion, despite being more slender from our vantage point, and thank you so much. If, if anyone's downloading this in a couple of days' time, um, they won't get the benefit of, um, of, of Paul acting this out. <laughs> Paul I'm doing, doing the interpretive dance of M81 and M82 colliding. <laughs> Glamorous the astronomical right there. Marceau. There we go, look. <laughs> But nevertheless, uh, these should both be very easy to spot after looking at the dimmer, but no less spectacular pinwheel galaxy. Uh, and don't forget, there's uh, one of the great planetary nebulas as well in the middle of the bear, uh, just behind the star Merak at the bottom of the two pointers. If you work along the base of the saucepan from Merak, you'll come quite easily to M M97. It's it's really difficult to miss it's the owl nebula um and larger scopes so you'll you'll pick out the eyes um the owl face where well, you'll see why it's called the owl and right near it is m108 uh, a spiral galaxy that's in a nice wide field lens you can see um the same view as the owl which is a really cool view you're making me feel really sad there paul because um i had a go at that from central london <coughs> central sidonia <laughs> just last week under perfect sky conditions or as perfect as they can be in london <coughs> sidonia and not even a whiff of it <laughs> it's it's bloody easy in my part of sidonia wiltshire um you've got the dark half of the book i got the dark half of the garden um <laughs> So, solar system. Okay, so moving on to the solar system. Yeah. Uh, Venus. I mean, pretty spectacular right now. Uh, it's going to continue blazing gloriously in the evening sky for quite a while. Uh, I'm not even going to bother telling you where to look. Just literally have a look and it's the brightest thing in the sky. I mean, yeah, you can't miss it. Um, 
Mars is technically visible in the southeastern sky before dawn, but extremely low on the horizon. Um, so it's probably not worth going for in terms of imaging and stuff like that. Um, but possibly worth a gander if you've got a clear horizon. Um, and you'll also have Jupiter and Saturn as well at the same time. Um, they'll just be slightly more sort of southerly. Um, on the morning of the 12th, uh, the moon and Jupiter will be about two degrees apart. And then on the morning of the 13th, you'll have the moon, Saturn and Jupiter making like a small arc in the in the mm -hmm. sky in the morning. Um, and then to the east of those lot will be Mars. So, I mean, if you're trying to get people into astronomy, um, you can try shouting at them over to the fence and say, hey, check that out. Obviously, <laughs> don't go near them. Put them, say... with, put them with your telescope if they get too and, close. And, and <laughs> as it's about sort of four o'clock in the morning, they'll love you for it. Ooh, yeah. yeah. I mean, and another reason why a refractor is better than a Maxitov because they're long enough to poke someone that's trying to get too close to you <laughs> under social distancing. Um, but that's it in terms of planets, really. There's not a lot going but, on, is there, honey? But but nice to have a couple more at least to look yeah. for in the gloom because it's been quite barren, hasn't it? Apart yeah. from Venus that's been beaming away, there's yeah. been nothing else. And now it was starting It'll to get a few more. It'll start to get more. better. Mm, start to get better. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's waiting for that that autumn, isn't it? When yeah. the, when yeah. Jupiter is going to be back in the sky, the, the the sort of dark evening skies. Can't wait for that. Yeah, yeah. So for the meteor showers this month, we have two fair to middling displays for northern hemisphere dwellers. One of which will be visible from the southern hemisphere too. Firstly, we have the more impressive of the two showers on offer this month, the Eta Aquariids, which runs from the 19th of April to the 28th of May each year, peaking on the 6th of May. But peak tends to be more spread out than most other meteor showers, so it lasts for a good few days either side of the 6th of May. So grab any clear night you can around this time. Like the Orionids, the Eta Aquariids are caused by the Earth passing through the debris left from Halley's Comet as it makes its regular 75-year orbit around the Sun. This shower has a rate of about one per minute, and many of them are usually quite bright. However, this year, we do have a full moon all night trying to ruin the party. That said, Northern Hemisphere observers should be patient and face the constellation of Aquarius in the east after sunset. The radiant will be a hands width above Mars and Neptune after midnight. In the Southern Hemisphere, the radiant will appear a hands width to the left of bright orange Mars in the east after midnight. I'm saying it's orange. It looks orange to me. It might be red. I don't know. I'm colorblind. So uh, you people with decent vision can correct me on that. <laughs> Is Mars orange or red? Uh, it's sort orange. of like a pale, r r peachy, orange. reddy. Yeah. Orange. Yeah. Uh, Mars uh, is just the most disappointing thing in the sky. Yeah. Frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Mars. It, it's, I, everyone gets excited about looking at Mars in telescopes, and I, I never see it. Oh just, come on, no! When you've got a nice opposition, oh, hang Mars on. Can look how great. can you, you two can, see you it definitely anyway? Definitely see a polar cap. Oh uh, yeah, I say we just have to look down at our feet. Yeah, I mean, it's, you yeah, get the best know, view of all. Just, yeah. yeah, that's why I can't understand you saying it's not a great sight. It's fantastic for us, Paul. You can see we peer right into the craters. Anyway, the yeah. second and less impressive shower this month is the Eta Lyrids, which runs from the third to the fourteenth of May, peaking on the eighth of May. This shower is far less impressive with a rate of just three per hour under ideal conditions, but they have been known to be quite eye-catching. These meteors are the debris left behind long-period comet C1983H1 Iras Araki Alcock. As it takes 970 years to complete an orbit, it doesn't get frequent chances to replenish the debris it leaves in Earth's way, and hence the low meteor rate. Fortunately, in the Northern Hemisphere, the radiant in Lyra is very high up and away from the gloom of the horizon, so lie back on a sun lounger as soon as it's dark and try the hour from 10.30 to 11.30 before the moon rises. We've had a couple of comments come through. Oh. Um, all right, here we go. Jen's pronunciation time. <laughs> Raphael, maybe? Raphael de Palma? Yep. So yep. I'm going for says um, I've tried to put some people um, into astronomy and showing them Venus and they were sure it was a satellite yeah oh, I, really? I've had that before people just don't mm. believe you that it's not something man made mm. because it's just so bright and particularly at the minute it is astonishingly bright so yeah I, I can believe yeah. that um, just poke them with your telescope until they believe you yeah 
Or and, bleed. And, but don't put the telescope on it and let them look, because then they'll just try and convince you it's the moon, because yeah. of its crescent shape. Oh, that's interesting. Has that actually happened? Mm. I would imagine it would do. If you, if you showed a newbie Venus through a telescope, they'd just say, well, it's the moon a long way away. Mm. Unless the moon was also up. Yes. I get that with kids out. in the sun. When I when I show kids the sun, they just go, it's the moon. Really? <laughs> Even yeah, if- yeah. When, they, when you get goggles on or through a telescope, they just go, it's the moon. It's like, no, it's the sun. <laughs> it's just, just filtered. It's the sun, you idiots. Um, morons, all of them. Uh, right, uh, the moon phases. Um, this month, first quarter is on the 1st, full on the 7th, last quarter on the 14th, and new on the 22nd, returning to first quarter on the 30th. So all that remains is to wish you... Clear skies and happy, happy hunting. hunting. Happy hunting. Although um, we have had another comment yes. from Alex oh. Bell. Oh, yes. go on. Uh, is it true that the Alcor Mizar double star was used as a sight test for Roman centurions? Who knows? It said it was, and also yeah, for I've Arabian heard. horsemen. But who knows? Because it's so easy to spot, I don't know. Unless their eyes were so bad in those days that it was a... a, a yeah. Or, or unless the stars were closer together, maybe. The Pleiades. Know. The Pleiades were, were supposed to be as well. That's another one. How many so you could see? To, yeah, you're supposed being, to have to like, draw the Pleiades. I'm not being funny, but I can see like Alcor and Mizar from light polluted Cardiff. Right? Like, and it is shocking light pollution where I live. So mm. yeah, their eyesight must have been really bad. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. were. They, so, they, I don't know. It was poorer in the past. Everything was in black and white for a start. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Although, actually, I'm saying that. I can see them when I've got my glasses on. I haven't looked to see if I can actually see them when I've got my glasses on. I'm thinking about it now, and I'm like, well, actually, maybe Hang it on. is a good test. Hang on a minute. Hang There's on. something in this sight test. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah actually, do you know what? I'm going gonna, gonna to have a go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test and take my glasses off, see if I can still see them. Yeah. yeah. When it's not cloudy, which it is for, like, the next three days, because it is actually right. pissing down, we- right? We we have a we have a volunteer, don't we? Oh, we do. Yes, John's been working around in the background to to get us a volunteer to um, to to hum the stinger for us. And uh, the great news is we've got uh, our good friend Ralph Van Eindhoven. Hopefully, I'm mangling his name, um, <laughs> and he's going to do it in Dutch. So take it away, Ralph. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it sounded a bit English to me. <laughs> okay, so now we turn to our regular tour and guide to the electromagnetic spectrum. And this month we're going to take a look at the submillimeter and far infrared part of the spectrum, GN. Oh, I'm so excited about this bit this time um, because this is what I do my research in, right? So and I, I kind mm-hmm. of, I've literally like word vomited onto the page and I'm looking at my notes like in the script and yeah, we're going to be I'm, here for a while. I'm looking at the notes. <laughs> if anyone if anyone needs a break, <laughs> just like, you know, nip out, Yeah, you've got, to, to be away. honest, you've got time for a poo. Like, I'm going to be here you, for a while. You, you're, <laughs> she's, you're obsessed with poo at the moment. <laughs> That's every he's conversation coming, he's coming out of me <laughs> like, every conversation <laughs> every day on our Kushner back channel involves you and some sort of scatological event <laughs> you might also live with three blokes who are yeah. at times pretty so it's grim it's scatological event oh, oh, it's, it's, God. Um, anyway back to the science um, no more poo gate on yeah you've show. got time for a takeaway or anything it's, it's like <laughs> Kick back, get a beer. Yeah. Or get yourself comfortable. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, in the section this time is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we can learn about the sky sort of at these wavelengths. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about my research because um, I thought it might be nice to do it. Um, so in general, far infrared of millimetre, um, it's anything from about 30 microns through to less than one millimetre. So uh, for once in astronomy, the name submillimetre is actually pretty self-explanatory, right? <laughs> it makes sense for once. Um, um, so we're, we're still looking at long wavelengths, so it's still reasonably low energy stuff. Um, we're looking at cold things, really, far infrared submillimetre astronomy. Things that like minus 170 degrees Celsius or, you know, even colder. Um, the dust the eye study is you know we're sort of looking at minus 250 degrees celsius 
uh, really, really very, very cold things. And typically we use far infrared, seven millimeter astronomy for like galactic studies and extra galactic studies. So extra galactic is things outside of our galaxy. And by galactic, I mean stuff outside the solar system. Um, but you can study like the outer planets uh, because they're cooler. So they're emitting light at the right temperature. Um, uh, sorry, they're emitting light at the right wavelengths. Um, and you can learn some pretty cool things about like comets and asteroids and stuff. And I got a little bit distracted by then um, by a comment that we've got in um, from TNT in BC saying, it's not poo, it's dust. But I mean, maybe it is, I don't know. Talk to the toilet, see what the toilet says. Um, anyway, back to 7 meter astronomy. Um, so a great example of when we, we managed to learn a little bit about the solar system was with Herschel Space Observatory. And it determines the origin of water in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter actually comes from comet impacts. Um, it particularly looked at Comet Shoemaker-Levy and um, the impact sites of that comet um, coincided with water vapor in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. So that's pretty cool. Um, Hirsch, the Herschel Space Observatory also found water vapor on Ceres, um, which was pretty unexpected because you don't actually you know, typically expect to find water on asteroids. And it kind of led to the definition between comets and asteroids to become more and more blurred. Um, but far infrared meter astronomy really comes into its own um, with the study of like gas and dust on galactic and extra galactic scales. That's really where its bread and butter is. And there's lots of spectral lines I've got to tell you, I am getting so distracted by all the comments that are coming in. We've got Blake Furman saying, are you sure it's dust, Jen? It could be planets. <laughs> I mean, this is true, but I hope it isn't because otherwise all my research is, uh, is definitely down the place where all the other dust is going, apparently, in my house. Anyway, uh, far infrared, seven millimeter astronomy. <laughs> Morgan Morgan says, close encounter of the third kind. <laughs> <laughs> which is very very true um but i'm gonna have to minimize this chat otherwise i'm never gonna get through this segment and we are literally gonna be here all evening um and i'm gonna read out the rest of the comments at the end so keep them coming um yeah anyway back to fire and fire sub millimeter astronomy um it's all about studying gas and dust really at uh, galactic and extragalactic scales there's a lot of different spectral lines from different molecules in the fire and fire sub millimeter and um, particularly for carbon and oxygen um and particularly as you go back through the history of the universe, you can detect these spectral lines out to like really, really high redshifts. So it helps us to find like some of the earliest galaxies. Um, there's lots of spectral lines for carbon and oxygen. So this means that we can figure out what the gas in galaxies is made of. Um, and it allows us to trace how much of it there is. And that's really important because it helps us figure out like where a galaxy is on its evolutionary path. And it helps us find, you know, evidence of past mergers, um, things like that. And then we've got giant molecular clouds, the birthplace of stars. Um, if we can work out how much gas there is, we can predict how many um, stars will form, what mass they might have. And you know that helps us learn about how stars form in general. Um, but really the fire and fire millimeter is where stars themselves actually fade away and where dust, my favorite thing, begins to glow. And it is this part of the spectrum that allows us to see the universe in... <laughs> Jesus Christ, Paul, I was on a roll then. <laughs> the people... Is that a Cabbage Patch doll it... that Paul's just put in his picture frame? So anyone who's not listening to this, they're listening to the recording afterwards. Um, Paul turned his video off and he's now turned back on and he's replaced himself with a Cabbage Patch doll wearing his hoodie, just staring blankly, slightly off camera. Um, God, it's like Children of the Damned. I know, I, I'm pretty scary. sure that like when I look away, it'll look at me. And then when I look at it again, it'll look away. It's, it's one <laughs> of those sorts of dolls, right? <laughs> um, anyway, so Fire and Fresh of Millimeter, um, it really does allow us to see the universe in a completely different way. And it allows us to see things which are really otherwise failed for, uh, veiled from view. Now, dust, my favourite thing. Uh, is something that we can very readily study in the far infrared submillimeter. And dust makes up a very tiny proportion of the interstellar medium. So that is the stuff between the stars, the gas, the dust, uh, from which more stars and planets are born. Um, by mass, dust is about 1% of the interstellar medium for like a typical galaxy in the nearby universe. I thought it was more than that. I thought no, it was a lot more than that. Absolutely mm. tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, mm. 
And despite it being such a small amount, it really does have a profound effect on our ability to sort of study the universe. So dust absorbs starlight and then it re-emits it in the far infrared. And it's been estimated that about half the starlight ever emitted across the history of the universe has been absorbed by dust and then re-radiated in the far infrared. So think about that. Half, half of all the starlight that has ever been emitted has been blocked out, absorbed by dust. So by not looking at the universe in the far infrared, we are literally missing out on half of it. So it is a really important part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And by staring at the birthplace of stars in the far infrared, we can kind of pull back that dusty veil that's shielding them from view. You know, the stars are born in these big clouds of gas and dust and we can kind of peer through that and we can see what's going on underneath. So we can see brand new stars that have just ignited and they're heating up the dust around them. Um, We can see the faint glow of debris disks around young stars, which are... (laughs) Which... (laughs) I'm trying to do some this is serious. So unfair, Rick I know Paul. I'm doing, trying to do some very serious educating here, and um, Teresa, which is why I decided to name the doll, um, has just moved significantly closer to the camera and is uh, making me feel very uncomfortable. So, <laughs> I think the hint might be to wrap it up soon because the more I talk about dust, the closer she's going to get. It's it's like that episode of um, Doctor Who Blink, isn't it? The more you talk about dust, the closer the death doll gets. Yeah, it is. So, I mean, it's a good job that I still have a lot to go, isn't it? So, um, <laughs> shall we carry on? Um, so, we can look at debris disks around stars, which are um, ready to form planets. Um, we can study dying stars and, you know, watch these dust factories at work. Um, we can look at stars like Betelgeuse, which has a hu- huge shells of cool dust around it, and we can see all these different shells. Um, we can look at supernovae remnants and um, watch them literally form in dust. Um, and also, light in the far infrared allows us to see some of the oldest galaxies in the universe, which are just shrouded by so much dust because they're just so kind of prolific at producing stars that there's just so much dust. You cannot see them in the optical. Like, you just can't. You, you look at that patch of sky in optical wavelengths and there's like diddly squat, blank sky. You look at it in the far infrared and suddenly you've got all these glowing blobs. And it, I think it's just amazing. Um, And so, really, studying dust is a bit like doing galactic archaeology because dust is produced by stars it allows us to sort of trace the past star formation history of a galaxy and it allows us to figure out what stars were there before and sort of what stages the galaxy has gone through in its history and and things like that so where does my work come into this um so in my first paper which is on munras if you type my name It will come up and it's super exciting. Um, So I use the emission from dust to trace the amount of gas in galaxies um, over much of cosmic history. And um, we couldn't do this for individual galaxies because um, far infrared astronomy, unfortunately, um, it really suffers from poor resolution. So anything really beyond the local group, kind of all the galaxies are looking like blobs. Um, And that's if you can even see them above the noise levels in your image. So a lot of the galaxies that I was studying, we couldn't see them above the noise level. So what we do is um, we use statistics and averaging techniques. And so what we do is we uh, study these sort of similar galaxies that are similar by mass and they're at similar points in the universe going back through cosmic time to sort of get average properties and kind of figure out the story there. So we use about 63,000 galaxies covering a one square degree patch of sky. Um, and we found that as you go back in time, galaxies have more and more gas until about two, two and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Um, and then it's kind of sort of seems to level off, kind of plateau. Um, so the mass of gas in galaxies is constant. Um, but once we get back to that point in cosmic time, we're working with you know low number statistics, not many galaxies. The assumptions we were making were starting to break down. So we don't know whether it's a real effect or if it's sort of an, an issue with with the way we were doing the analysis. But if it is a real effect, it's quite interesting because it's about a billion years before we get the peak of star formation in the history of the universe and, you know, the time when galaxies were most ferociously forming stars. So is it a coincidence that we get the most gas in galaxies about a billion years before we've got the most stars being formed or not? That's, that's, that is the question. Um, 
which we can't answer with the current data that we have, but uh, there are some studies and stuff coming online which will enable us to maybe probe that part of cosmic history a bit better and help us figure it out. So, uh, either way, I reckon that fire and fire astronomy is pretty damn neat. Um, it's a really mm-hmm. powerful tool for studying all sorts of hidden phenomena. Um, it's particularly crucial for galaxy evolution. And that's why I think everyone should study dust and not just think it's a nuisance. The Ooh, end. We even got a promo for infrared astronomy at the end. Mm. Ooh. Well, I did put a shout out for uh, for another panelist on here to uh, to be the, a stinger hummer, but we've not had anything yet. Oh, so Paul, no, it's going to have to be you. No, we've, we've got something on, on Twitter. Oh, have we? We have. We have. What's that? Hang on. Dead air's a crime, Paul. Oh, I'm just, I'm just... <laughs> Whoa! Nice! That's fantastic! Is that mono or polyphonic? That's polyphonic, isn't it? That's fantastic. Who did that? That's from the one and only Kevin Morgan. Well, now that is freaky. That's nice. I like that. There we go. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, I, I I believe it's just me. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah. It, there we go. Look, so it's just me. Well, um, it's just me running awesome astronomy now. I um, clearly the other two have um have died. Um, and we've always agreed that if if any of them died, we'd just carry on anyway. So we're just going to carry on. Um, so this is now the um my awesome astronomy. Um, right. <laughs> well, I shall wait and see what happens. I, I'm waiting for um. Methuselah is with you always. Oh, Methuselah's with me. Come on to the screen. Join us. I, I feel lonely. Um, where, where, is, where is Damien? Show us your face. I am Awesome Astronomy Live. You are Awesome Astronomy. He's a talking planet. Look at that. Um, right. Well, I, I, I don't know what uh, it is. It's the Paul and Methuselah show. I don't know what's going on. They, they suddenly just froze. It was Kevin Morgan's tune was so amazing. They just died. Um, John, Jenny's, and Ralph's internet have all died uh, simultaneously. I believe they are all on Virgin Media. So Virgin Media has just gone down. Yep. Uh, there's a recommendation for uh, yeah. an ISP for you. Well, there we go. Um, well, I shall, I shall continue anyway. And funny enough, it's very appropriate that uh, Kevin just did the stinger there because actually the uh, the email for our question for for the host this evening was actually from Kevin, funnily enough, and it was a carryover from um, our little thing we did um, our Q and A, which we never got round to one. And the, Kevin asks, "Oh, Imperial Lords, we should get him on to talk." It's Kevin. Are you there? That's I don't know if I can get you on. No, we probably can't get you on. Uh, so, O Imperial Lords of Lockdown and Majestic Queen of Dragons, may I, as one of your humble followers, dare to be bold enough to put forward a question for your consideration in thine upcoming broadcast from hallowed ground that is Cydonia. I like this. It's very good. Right, enough of that. How on earth do scientists work out the trajectories of putting satellites in orbit around other bodies? Or on trajectories that take them past numerous objectives, and how critical are these calculations? I get the principle about accelerating items using gravitational slingshot for objects further out than Earth and needing to use gravity to slow objects down for objects closer to the sun, but how do they do it? Many thanks, and keep up the excellent show and Twitter comments. Well, here we are. So, um, it's all Newton, baby. It's all about the Newton. Um, and Kepler, bit of Kepler. But really, it's Newtonian mechanics. Um, and the equations, in some sense, are actually pretty simple. This is this is kind of the mad thing about sort of space science and, and the science of, of spacecraft. Is actually, a lot of it is um, the stuff you did at school. It is the stuff you did at school, um, those, those sort of Newton equations, taken taken to their sort of more complex level. But it's it, the principles are the same. So the example um, being satellite orbital speed. A satellite orbital speed is uh, the, the equation for that is um, velocity, the orbital speed, velocity equals the square root of g multiplied by the mass of the central body uh, divided by the orbital radius, uh, if you were following that. Um, so that's the square root of g, and of course g is the universal gravitational constant, which is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons per meter squared kilogram squared. Um, and 
it's multiplied by the mass of the body you're going around, so the mass of the Earth, the mass of Jupiter, whatever it is, uh, divided by the orbital radius, how far out you're going to go. So you can calculate the speed you want to go at, and that will give you your your uh, velocity round in orbit. Um, you relate this related to question uh, in sort of equations, um, of course, for acceleration and orbital period, um, and then it's a matter of playing with the Sayo-Kolovsky rocket equation. Um, which is your way of calculating your rocket speed and acceleration in a vehicle losing mass. Because, of course, if you think of a rocket taking off, it's getting lighter all the time. So the maths of how that rocket is accelerating and you know, force equals mass times acceleration and all the rest of it um, changes all the time because the mass is changing. So um, uh, there's a Russian, uh, Solokolovsky, who worked out the, the, what's known as the rocket equation. Um, and it's not actually that complicated. It's, it's a bit involved. But combine that with that orbital speed one, which also, you can also rearrange to work out the orbital uh, radius and things like that, then actually that that's it. The mathematics is not that complicated. It gets more complicated the more, the, the further you go, the the kind of, what bodies you're going around and of course you've got the sort of three four five six body problems of moons going around jupiter and things like that and all their gravitational influences so it is quite complicated but fundamentally with all of it it's still newtonian physics um so um if you send a craft to a particular angle towards a body it will accelerate at a certain speed and you can calculate its exit angle at, um in a set of equations that are, are basically in the principia from sort of 350 years ago so that that's it there's einstein of course in terms of gravity has replaced newton in the kind of bigger sense but actually on the, on the day-to-day kind of use of, of rocketry and, and spacecraft it's no different it's still isaac newton um so there we go that that's the answer there um so Oh, thank you. Yes, no problem. No problem, Kevin. Joe just just thanked me. But yeah, it, it it's um you can look these up. The the, the rocket uh, equation is really really fascinating. Actually, it's a really really interesting one because it's um I remember one it's A level physics. It was one of the um problem um I had on uh, uh when I was doing A level physics. I did a project on rockets as I would as a nerdy eighteen year old, and it it struck me immediately. It was like, hang on a minute, how do I calculate how, how the rocket? takes off so um it was my kind of introduction to quite complex physics was was working out the rocket equation um which was a great great thing to do when you're 18 because it was it, it kind of felt like proper physics it was something something really interesting Okay, well, I'm going to finish the show off because um, we need to finish off. I don't know if they're going to come back. If Virgin Media has gone down the Swanee, I might as well uh, finish us off. Um, can you still hear me? Everybody can still hear you. Good. It's okay. I, uh, I'm getting this message. It says your speaker is not working. Oh, God, not me as well. Right. Well, that's all they have. I've got to do a Ralph Ralph impression. Um I don't know how to do a Ralph impression. Anyway, well, that's all we have time for the show. Thank you very much for joining us live and for contributing to the show in the way we always hoped we'd be able to interact. Every time we record, we intend reading the most recent thoughts and comments as they come in by email or Twitter, but nothing beats having you around us as we're doing it in real time. And I have to say, I, I do enjoy this. This is quite good fun. Remember to subscribe. Remember to uh, hit the subscribe button. Uh, Damien has been uh, beavering away, putting our, our episodes on YouTube. So if you want to catch up on the back catalogue, um, they're all appearing on YouTube. Uh, what season are we at now? Uh, just uploaded season eight. Season eight is up there now. Um, so we're, we're getting there. And so subscribe. Give us Q&As. Um, I don't know when we're going to do a live one again. Um, hopefully a bit more successfully without people dropping out of the... Uh, so, until our exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Sidonia Base, where I sit all alone with Damien. The end. I'll always be with you. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien, and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science, and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. 
If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.